Today we are going to talk about this guy, Xi Jinping. And I think I won't be able to cover all his life today. So probably I will uh, cover it in two to three sessions, right? Uh, I don't know whether you, you want me to do all the three sessions together in, in one set in consecutive or we slot in somewhere out in the middle because obviously just talking about Xi Jinping a bit too. And I, I just knew that, so I will watch it tonight. You, you'll give us a true version. Yeah. Yeah, I will give you my version. <laughs> Um, my version of Xi Jinping. <laughs> and Xi Jinping, and then he has a younger brother and two sisters. About him is his father, and next to him is his mother. And that two persons is very important in his life. I, especially his mother. His mother has a very, very strong influence in uh, Xi Jinping's attitude towards life. Okay. This is his father with Xi Jinping and his younger um, brother. Uh, Xi Jinping, uh, over the last 50 years, becomes one of the most powerful leaders in the world, right? Xi Jinping today is pretty powerful. Everybody can agree with that one, okay? And his father, his father is also a revolutionary. Uh, he participated in the, um, with Mao Zedong at the beginning. So his father is part of the original uh, Communist Party. Uh, his father once was the vice premier for along Mao Zedong in the Chinese civilization. So he is no stranger to politics. He, is grew, he grew up with all these um, political figures together, young kids in the same area, all of them are uh, powerful politicians in China. That was when he was young. He is born in 1953, so he is younger than most of most of us here. Um, he is a princeling, and later become an outcast when his father was purged in 1962 for supporting somebody else. Okay, and that was uh, the Cultural Revolution. Uh, meaning his father was one of those political uh, leaders. So he becomes a prince, but his father is vice premier. He's, there's a group of uh, young kids at that time grew up together in the um, area where all these uh, politicians live. is in, in one of the uh, suburbs near, uh, in Beijing near the uh, Tiananmen near uh, the Forbidden City. But that suburb is very much closed off because all the major politicians all live in that area. And Xi Jinping will be living in that area, playing with all other princelings. He has a younger brother. And when his father was jailed, he had to escaped from persecution. So he escaped from Beijing and went into the rural area of uh, Sanxi in the low Western Sanxi. So let, uh, this 16 years Prince Lang and then among millions of urban youth were sent to the rural area as up the mountain, down the countryside movement. Okay, that, that is the, for re-education by farmers and laborers. Basically, it's a political persecution, put it that way. But 
at that time, millions of youth are doing that. At that time, there is a almost a anti uh, um, it's what's the word anti intellectual. Mm -hmm. Oh, it almost so all the people who have studied sent to the countryside to learn from the farmers. So this is pretty much an anti intellectual. Of course, at Princeton, <laughs> initially wasn't accustomed to this hard work. You go to the countryside, live with the uh, farmers. Uh, now, uh, Sensi is a very cold area in winters. So they live, they, they will sleep on a hot bed. And uh, underneath the hot bed, they will use cow dung, etc., as fire. So there will be a fire on that, and then you that the big um, uh, bed will have a lot of people sleeping all one by one. And at that condition, there will be, what's that, that thing that bites people? Um, yeah, bad, 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 something like that. So he was beaten <laughs> very well. But there's one, one interesting is, he is a good storyteller. So after, now, at that time, after dark, no electricity, basically you have nothing to do. You can't do anything. So he is a good storyteller and he knows he, ha he, he is literate, okay? Therefore he can help the uh, villagers to do some writing, tell some sort. So although he, he is a princeling, he adapted to his life quite easily, quite well. So at that time, after that, that he actually flew back to Beijing, where he was locked up. So he had to go again. So he go to the second place. Now, that is um, some of his uh, photographs, but that one is, uh, I think, is later than that period. Because at that period, he was very thin, but that is the place he stayed at. And of course, today, being Xi Jinping, what he had experienced becomes a museum. So it has been um, decorated and you see people having um, buy tickets to go in to look at what kind of life Xi Jinping has went through during that uh, um, cultural revolution period. I haven't been there, so I, I don't know what is inside. Uh, Xi Jinping is sort of typical of that generation in having a pretty tough outlook. As they say in, chi in Chinese, they are age bitless and they are not people who give up easily. It made a pretty tough generation because they, they went for a very, very tough life. And that also has a large impact on his um, future or, or the recent um, political moves he has. Uh, 2020 is a historical year in many, many aspects. Of course, number one is of course the COVID-19 spread throughout the world. But among the COVID-19 in China, there's another very good story coming up is that China eliminated, eliminated extreme poverty in 2020. In China, the extreme poverty is defined as $2.30 US, uh, $2 US dollars, 30 cents, 230 US dollars per day per person. Mm. So if you have income less than that, you are considered as extreme poor. China has now eliminated everyone and that means everyone is living above that level now. So Albert, hmm? um, you're talking about the generation that grew up during the Cultural Revolution. Yep. By any chance, is Jane Levy present in your class today? Jane Levy, is that a Jane Levy here? Nope. Jane was a member of my comparative religion course at 
Nana Wadding. And she was one of these people who grew up during the Cultural Revolution. Uh. And some of the stories that she told were very, very interesting. And um, also Albert, very is fun. there anybody else in the room with you who did grow, grow up in the Cultural Revolution? Is that anyone grew up in Cultural Revolution? No, I'm, I'm not as well because I, uh, at that time I was in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, in, yeah. In China, so I, I really didn't oh. go through the Cultural Revolution. <laughs> not to worry, not to worry. But I, but I understand what happened during the Cultural, cultural Revolution uh, by, by reading, unfortunately. <laughs> And there's, there's one book. Hello. There's one book I I can only read a few pages every time because it's just too sad. The book is called The Tomb, Tombstone. You you have that body, you have Tombstone. The book title is Tombstone. And it talks about the stories of 100 Persians during um, the Cultural Revolution. So that was a very sad story to read. But anyway, let's move on. He started his impressive political journey by applying to join the Communist Party. But it took him 10 attempts before he, he was accepted. Because now, again, China is ruled exclusively by the Chinese Communist Party, that there is no change of party in China, Chinese government. It's a single government rule. Okay? And today, the Chinese uh, Communist Party has a membership of around 80 million, 80 million membership. And this membership spread throughout China in, into very small village as well. Almost every village, there will be a party secretary who is also a member of the uh, CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. So Chinese Communist Party is throughout China. So don't be surprised that there are Chinese uh, Communist Party because it's just everybody, almost. But formal membership, 80 million. Imagine these 80 million have a wife, have a child, and they probably have parents. So you multiply that by four. It's already 300 million people involved in the Chinese Communist Party. So it is a huge, huge party. Given that Xi, Xi Jinping being a princeling took them 10 times to join, obviously, the party thing uh, he might not be the kind we want, but he joined. The reason Xi Jinping insisted on joining is because of his mother. His mother insisted that if you want to have a future, you must join the CCP. So even 10 attempts failed, he still applied and eventually he joined. So after the, the Cultural Revolution, after Mao Zedong died in 1976, then China started this uh, opening and reform program under Deng Xiaoping. By then, Xi Jinping was admitted into Tsinghua and studied chemical engineering. Now, I, I remember I mentioned that last time, so far, except Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping, all the premiers and presidents has been from engineering, including Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping is a chemical engineer. But later on, he was also admitted back to Tsinghua. Uh, Tsinghua is the top university in China. So Tsinghua is the top, okay? And he did his PhD at Tsinghua as well. But that, that time he, he is not engineering anymore, is on um, social reform kind of uh, social science type of thing. So after graduating, he faced a tough choice. 
in between 1979 to 1982, we, we can hardly find any information about Xi Jinping. He seems to disappear. No, he doesn't talk about that time. And what we only know is that he is the secretary of a um, vice premier and the uh, central commission, military commission. So his father, being a military man, sent his eldest son to follow one of his most trusted followers and be that trusted followers personal secretary. Xi Jinping had, at that time had no official title. He just accompanied this vice, vice uh, premier do whatever the vice premier asked him to do. He, he is not official, but these three years these couple of years, I think Xi Jinping built up a very big, well connection with the military. Obviously, this guy is the second general of the Central Military Command. So he will be meeting all kinds of military uh, top persons. And Xi Jinping, being his personal secretary, will be accompanying him and meeting all these people. So. Xi Jinping at that time probably had built up a very good connection with the military at the very top through his father's influence. Then, under his mother's influence, he go to the village and start from the very beginning, like all the people in China. He go to Hebei, a small county, as a deputy party secretary. Start from very top bottom, okay? Top bottom. And then make his way up until the president of China. Uh, that process like this. Now, a lot of people say, oh, China have no uh, election. Wrong. China has election. Just like here, we don't elect our prime minister directly. We indirectly elect our prime minister because we elect the party, the party with the maximum control of the member of the house, they form the government, right? And the leader of that party becomes our prime minister, right? So we are not electing our prime minister. Unlike United States, they elect their president. We don't. We elect the party and the party through the internal process, determine who is the leader and that becomes our prime minister. So we have changed of prime minister quite often without election. Remember Calvin Rudd, Julie Gaylor, Calvin Rudd, right? Now, Chinese system doesn't go work like that. Instead of the ability to vote for the parliament okay, in the, the top, the Chinese people get to elect at the very bottom the party secretaries, the local party secretaries are elected by the people around it. Now you don't need to be a uh, communist party member to vote for the party secretary. The party secretary basically is uh, sent by the CCP to the local village, okay? That person join in, if there's another leader in, in, the, in the village, he can challenge him and become the chief of the village. So, whether this party secretary can remain, has to work to earn the trust of the villager, and then he can work for the villagers. Now, in a county, you may have a number of villagers. All these villagers together will vote for their representative in the next level up. So you have village, county level, the county level members are voted by the village chiefs but not by the villagers. The villagers only votes for the village chief and the village chief votes for the next level up, the county level. And all the county level members votes for the next level up, the province. In one province, you may have many, many counties and all these counties um, members will be able to vote for the province uh, party one level up. And then the provinces votes for the people in the National Congress, who represent them in the National Congress. 
So the voting system is indirect. The direct participation is at, at the very bottom. Uh, that is very different from our voting system. Our voting system votes for people in the parliament. Okay, and then the next level up is indirect because the, which, whichever party form government, their party leaders becomes our prime minister, right? But in China, we vote for the bottom up. People vote for the lowest level and all the lowest level go together and vote for the next level up. And all these next level people go together and vote for the next level up there go. Right, so there is a major difference in the election system in, in China. Xi Jinping is able to climb through all these stages from village, county, province, and then eventually enter into the um, central political blue. At the very top, and then they will have standing committees and so forth. There is a I don't know whether this um, will be in writing or not, but we noticed that all the previous um, political leaders, their children doesn't enter into politics. That means China have no second nation politicians. Xi Jinping is almost an exception because Xi Jinping's father is also a central government's uh, politicians, okay? But looking at the rest of the previous leaders after, after Deng Xiaoping, none of them has parents who are also a politicians in the last generation. Xi Jinping is the exception. And it's also the ex exception for the lower levels as well. Xi Jinping doesn't have a son. He only has a daughter, one daughter. So nobody's afraid of Xi Jinping passing his power to his daughter. And for all the other premiers after Deng Xiaoping, none of them is in politics. So that's one very interesting tradition I have observed. The second interesting observation is that during the Cultural Revolution, some of the comrades of Mao Zedong was executed. Their children, none of them is in politics because there's a what revenge uh, what's that called hate due to your parents being killed so they don't want this group of second generation to affect the the polit political system so this group which have their fathers executed or die during the Cultural Revolution, they end up all in business, making good money, okay? Having the connections, they're making good money, but they are not in politics. Xi Jinping being exceptional because his father didn't die during Cultural Revolution. And after Cultural Revolution, his father actually go back to the political system and becomes the uh, party secretary for the uh, Guangdong province. So his father is pretty, now, we all heard of uh, a town called Shenzhen. Yeah, Shenzhen didn't, didn't exist 40 years ago. It was a village. It was Xi Jinping's father suggested that we need to find a place to experiment opening up. Where to do it? Well, at that time, he was the uh, sec general secretary of the Condon province. Uh, okay, I will, my province will do it. Where? Next to Hong Kong. Why? Because Hong Kong will become China Chinese territory. No doubt about that. It's just a matter of time. Secondly, Hong Kong at that time is an industrial plus commercial center. And we have expertise both in business and manufacturing in Hong Kong. So we can leverage on Hong Kong being so close. So they selected Shenzhen. And now Shenzhen has a population more than 11 million people. 
over 40 years. Very remarkable. But anyway, that is the power of Xi Jinping's father. Xi Jinping's father still have a very large influence in, in terms of helping Xi Jinping to climb up. But uh, as I met, yes. Yes, yes. A number of uh, vice premier, etc., are ladies, including the one who sent to uh, uh, Wuhan. You went know, Wuhan the the COVID nineteen. Uh, the central uh, government sent a top level representative to monitor the work in Wuhan and Kobe, and she is a woman, a very tough woman actually. You have to be very tough in order to climb to the very top. Well, but apropos of that, you said earlier that um, uh, Xi's um, daughter could not um, uh, could not take over from him. Um, surely, if um, women can get to positions of power, there's a possibility that she would, or not. Theoretically, she, she could, but practically, she won't because we know that she is not a politician. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. Fair, fair enough. A different yeah. reason. That's fine. Uh, different reason. It's her personal choice. And right. that different reason is also one of the reasons why she remains selected. Because now, after all, Xi Jinping is elected by the standing committee to become the, the president. He's elected, okay, but not directly by the people in China. It's by the top representative, the 3,000 people National Congress. So he had to gain the trust of this 3,000 people in order to get into the Central Committee and becomes the head of China. And when they selected the president, they take that into account as well. They really want China. Uh, CCP to rule China forever. That's at least that's what they try to do. Okay, Xi Jinping, and uh, that is the first lady of China at the moment. Uh, Pan Lai Yuan. Uh, she is a military man, a uh, really military woman. On the what's that? The military musical group. She has a master degree in uh, singing, and she's a very good singer. And before we know Xi Jinping, she is much more famous than Xi Jinping by a very large margin. Um, his wife is well known throughout China because every year during the uh, eve of New. Uh, Chinese New Year, there's a big gala, a big show, and she is regular and there. Uh, for that kind of show, we are talking about a uh, viewership of a billion people. So when we talk about some, uh, some, some uh, stars here having a million fans, sorry, you are not even as a fourth level uh, stars in China. Any star in China, you will start with 10 million people and or above. 100 million people, stars are nothing in China. We are talking about 500 million, a billion uh, fans. So she is very, very famous, but she is the second wife. Um, Xi Jinping's first, first wife lasted less than a year. They disagree on one very key aspect. He's Former wife want to immigrate out of China. Xi Jinping doesn't want to. So that is a big argument. And, and probably their, their characters also doesn't match. Now, this is their color photographs. Um, Pang is the first presentable first lady <laughs> of China. The previous one is not as fashion as pain. <laughs> but anyway, this is a joke. Okay.
when CDP is in Zhejiang, that is between 2002 and 2007, he put a lot of effort in building economic growth. Uh, to advance during that time when Xi Jinping uh, is advancing, it's a competition of about the growth of your region. Your region grow faster, you have more chance to go to next level up. Then you will manage a larger area. And if your area is uh, growing faster than the similar region, you grow another level up. So the challenge for all these leaders while they are moving up is how they can grow the economy. Now, but that changed in 2010. Remember in the first, uh, is that first or second uh, meeting we, we talked about uh, the, the, there's a marked difference between 2010 and 2000 and afterwards. There's almost like a marked difference. Okay? You will see China's not coming up like true after 2010, everything seems to progress very fast. Uh, 2010 is a very important year, I think, in uh, world politics. Before 2010, all the leaders in China basically um, fight their way up by managing economy. With a little bit at around 2000, with a little bit of emphasis on ecology of the surrounding. And then from Xi Jinping onwards, the focus shift from a pure economic growth into more social development. There's a very major shift. So I will come to that uh, later on, but members, okay. Now this is their structure. As I said, the party itself have almost 90 million members. And that it escaped all the middle class here. Okay, so there's a large group here from bottom to uh, county to province, etc. This is at the national level. Okay, at the national level, uh, the party congress is almost 3,000. Um, 2020 numbers of National Congress is 2,980. That varies a little bit by 10 or 20. It's around 3,000, okay? 3,000 parliament member, okay? This is the parliament, uh, our, our decree into our Canberra's parliament, the two houses together. In China, we have no two house, it's only one house, okay? It's the uh, party congress. Now, this party congress usually meets twice a year for two weeks. So they, they can't do much. Only four weeks a year, they can't do much. So there is a standing committee, the central committee. The central committee will be chairman and vice chairman in the working groups in this party congress. They will form the central committees. And then the membership again changes F, F, every now and then, depending on, on how many subcommittees. There are subcommittee all the way around and all these subcommittees, secretary and vice secretary or deputy secretary will form the central committee. And from the central committee, they will vote for the people joining in the polit politic bureau. Okay. So, this 25 person will also be a member of this central committee as well. But obviously then they will take a lesser role and let the other members look after the, the details. And that 25 people will vote for the political standing committee. That seven plus one, it's eight people. That it is the top, le top level uh, power. All top level power is concentrated in the standing committee. And they are, they you go through, go through up that also by election. Okay. So people arguing China has no election, wrong. China has election. The direct election is at the bottom, the rest are in direct elections, right up to the very top. 
Xi Jinping is not able to climb up to that top from almost can't get in. <laughs> almost, yes. Just wondering, um, where the military fits into all of this. Military is controlled by the Communist Party. So unlike here, we have uh, multiple different uh, parties. So, so the military uh, preach the uh, royalty towards the country. But in China, the military push their royalty towards the party. So it's controlled by the party. And in the standing committee, there are members who control the militaries. Oh, but uh, sorry, yeah. remind me what is the population of China? The reason I asked the question, I'm interested to know what percentage of Chinese have joined the party. Okay. Uh, China has about 1.3 billion people, 1.38, something like that, almost 1.4 billion. So 90 million in the party, that's a very quick estimate. That's what about um, uh, 0.6 or 7% have joined the party. Yeah, about that. Right. So there's, well, that means in about a hundred people, there will be one or two being a member of the of the Communist Party. So the Communist Party is everywhere in China. You you will be surprised the the taxi driver or the bus driver are members of CCP. How hard is it to get into the party? It depends on your background. If your background is good. You can get in. Your background is not good. Very difficult. Mm -hmm. Xi Jinping was not very good at the beginning. So <laughs> now, understood, understood. It's all uh, about now. The party now, Chinese political system is very different from us. Now, the other important thing is, China has always been run by, um, what's that? Uh, or autocracy. That means by by ability. Now, in before uh, New China, we have different dynasty, right? All our different dynasties hold um, national examination to select government officials. So that has been going on for at least two thousand years. The examination system. So in China here, you being a member of the party you are assigned to a particular region to work but at the same time there will be time for professional development you have to enter into learn about all kinds of things and these classes are mandatory for all members at different stage so ccp is not only a a, a political party it's everything everything China, you will find some CCP involved, from fighting disease to making um, high speed rails or manufacturing everywhere. In factory, if you have a sufficiently large organization, there will be a CCP sub branch in your in your in your uh, company, and the branch is pretty powerful usually, because after all. They report directly to the province, and if you are not being right, then the province can really squeeze on you. So, now at that time, both of, both the uh, current um, premier uh, and Xi Jinping were the two uh, leading candidates. So a matter of who becomes the premier, who becomes the president. But eventually, she appointed as the president, and she is a very low key politician. Um, before he becomes president, almost in the West, nobody knows him. But not exactly, because as a vice president, he actually visited quite a number of places. The first visit to Australia is Tasmania. There's a 
very famous saying by Xi Jinping. He said, there are some foreigners from better off countries who have nothing better to do than point fingers at our affairs. Well, that's not interesting. The second part is China does not first export revolution, second export poverty, and third export a uh, cause troubles for you. What else do you have to criticize us about? <laughs> Mind your own business, basically. So these are the words in Chinese. I think I ah. Uh, uh, Xi Jinping said, of course, has a lot of titles, uh, including all this. He is the General Secretary of the Communist Party, Chairman of the Central Military Commission, President of the Chinese Republic, da, 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 da. He is very, very powerful, put it simply. Okay, so what's the time? I'm running a bit for, 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 uh, faster than I expected. So the next week, I want to do with the poverty, a, 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 a poverty reduction in China. We will be able to go back to at least 2000, 2006 and something like that, when Xi Jinping is still the um, the secretary of a province. Then you will see Xi Jinping already put property uh, reduction as his key achievement. So by the time Xi Jinping becomes the president at the top level, okay, that is in 2012, he's one of the most important tasks he, he asked the CCP to do is to eliminate property. Eliminate extreme property. And he set the deadline on 2020. Yes, according to China, they did. But of course, different people will have to. So uh, now, next Monday is a holiday. And then the Monday next, I will have a presentation on this one and a half hour on Zoom at 1.30 to 3. But I will break that one up into smaller pieces and put it here. So on that big one, I will cover um, some examples of the effort. How they verify the effort is, is done. Okay, I will mainly concentrate on this one. But here I will give you more examples of how uh, people in China uh, escape from extreme poverty. Now, it doesn't mean that China is well off. It just means that there is no extreme poverty. By extreme poverty is defined as $2.30 US dollars per day per person. So that is the uh, United Nations definition, uh, which is followed by China. China used that definition as well. Under that, that definition, according to the Chinese Communist Party, there's no people living under that. There are several, several mechanisms of doing that. So what I want to do is actually try to draw out the lessons, see whether the world can learn from Chinese experience. What are the lessons that, that give us this achievement? So 2020 is a very interesting year. Okay, since we have some time, let me go back to, uh, yes. Yes, commander in chief. Yes. No. Uh, yes, yes, he has to consult. Now, he will be the one who makes the final decision. But at that level, there are too many things to consider, and therefore there will be a whole group of um, what well, um, the people working for him to give him choices. So on that level, he can make the choice himself, but all the choices will be presented to him for him to, to select. So 
at this level of leadership, they are not going to do it by hand. Uh, not they are, they will only be directing. They are they won't be hands on. Put it that way. And therefore, in terms of policies, etc., they will have other people providing all the suggestions, and then he will make the decision what to take or not. But again, he is only the chairman of. So again, if he's working in a chair in a committee member. Chairman obviously has a lot of power. His parents are dead now. His brother and sister, I don't know. No information. I would be interested to know what his, his brother is doing. But no information. Uh, again, like um, most politicians in China, the Westerns seem to know very little. I think there are two reasons. Uh, first reason is um, the amount of um, the word states being used by the Chinese is very difficult to understand unless you really know the political system. So there is a lot of knowledge behind all the special terms that they being used. And these terms are coming up all the time, every almost every day. So that will be a continuous learning process in order to understand what's happening in China. And China is, too, is very large. And therefore, a lot of things is happening at any one time. Now, China has uh, natural, nat natural disasters on average five to 10 times a year. That's on average. For, for example, last year, we had the COVID-19. We have a drying season and then followed by a flood. So that is typical. Then, and then not too long ago, we will have uh, monsoons, we will have earthquakes. Remember, China has a Himalaya between China and India. And why Tibet is a plateau? Well, the reason is that the Australian tectonic plate collided with the Asia tectonic plate and our plate is heavier and go under as the Asia plate scratches on the settlements on the Australian plate that build up to the Himalayas. So that's why on the top of the Himalaya we will find fish shells and fish uh, bones etc because they are the sentimentals which scrap up and because of that our plate slide underneath now, technically, India is our set settlements, the, the Australian settlements. And therefore, the, the Australian plate lift up the Asian plate in Tibet and so on. So that, that's why there's a pacto there. China's, China's geography, geography is that we have the highest mountain, the Himalayas, the pacto, and then the basin, and then the plains, a free step. Uh, all the rivers from China runs from west to east, one that almost one direction. And weather runs from south to north or north to south, weather-wise. And therefore the major agriculture produce are in the southern region. The major industry is in the northern region. And the major political center is also in the northern region. So there comes a problem. How can you get food from south to north? The heavy transport before we can have machines, the heavy transport is by boat. So, but the the rivers flowing from west to east is not conducive for, for transporting goods from north to south. So about 2000 years ago, China st started digging canal canals linking north and south. And that has been ongoing for centuries. So that's why China has canals from Beijing to Hangzhou, north-south. So Chinese geology is also very interesting, affecting a little China. The other big, big influence on Chinese uh, 
political thinking is that Chinese think of government not at a oppos opposite of citizen. Government is part of the citizenship. They work together rather than oppose each other. The main reason is the Yellow River. The Yellow River is called yellow because it is yellow. The Yellow River's yellow come from a kind of soil called Laos. Laos is a powdery soil which will, uh, where it's rain, the, the, the rain are falling on ground and the, and the water will be yellow. And because it carries a lot of this uh, Laos soil. And this soil go to the Yellow River. And eventually when the river flow is slowed down, these sediments drop down. And therefore, Yellow River always floods. Flooding every five, 10 years, then you flood. So what the Chinese people do, every time it, uh, it is impossible to, to take out billion tons of these Laos from the river. So what they do, fill up the, the river bank. So the river bank go higher and higher and higher. And the river, as the river bank go higher, the river beds also go higher. And by now, on the two sides of Yellow River, the land is actually lower than the river bed. So when it floods, the water doesn't go back to Yellow River. That's a big problem, very, very big problem. That in here, when it floods, okay, floods, but when the river drains, the water go back to the river. But in China, it doesn't. It stays in the water, it stays in the ground because the river bed is higher. So you order to do that, we need large governments able to manage this long river. So Chinese has always favor large government and the large government also needs to have to support the people. So the relationship between government and citizenship is quite different from the relationship we understood in uh, Western politics. They are not opposing each other. So when you ask the Chinese people to give power to the government, they easily say yes. Why? Because the government is doing something for us without power. How can they do it? So Chinese are very willing to give the political power, political bodies, great power. And that great power always has plus and minus, right? The plus sign is that like China, the government government manage a large resource, able to mot motivate billions of people, and they can get work done fast. The bad thing is like we have Mao Zedong, have cultural revolution, then it is a disaster. So the question actually is, how can we develop a political system where only the best people, best in terms of both ability and moral, best people is able to go to the top? That is a thousand years challenge problem. How can we solve that problem? It seems that China provided one example for you to, to consider. Instead of ordinary people voting for the top level uh, par parliaments, we let them vote at the lower level. And these people move up by ability. If their abilities, even you have big, background like Xi Jinping. Remember, he is not the only princeling there. There will be hundreds, if not millions, if not thousands of princeling also wanting to move up. If you do not have the ability, you won't be able to move up. You, you may move up one or two levels, okay? That's fine. But you won't be able to move next level. You will be stopped somewhere at the limit of your ability. You really need the ability to move up to the top. And then the process, every five years, they have an election. So you can imagine from lower to next level, five years. Next level to next level, another five years. Next level to next level, another five years. Next level to next level, another five years. It's already 20 years. It's already 20 years. And then you have to stay in that National Congress for, we don't know how long before you will be able to 
get into that central standing committee, be able to uh, work in uh, small committees. By then, you will be demonstrating your ability and then you move in. So Xi Jinping started this journey in 1982, 83, about that time, and eventually becomes the um, president of China in 2012. So it takes him, what, 30, 40 years? 30, 40 years with background, with background. And of course, ability. I, I have no doubt Xi Jinping has good abilities, okay? If he hasn't got the ability, he won't be able to move up. I'm, I'm sure he has the ability, but moving up like this with this competition, 18 million people, 18 million members fighting for that job, you need to be very good and very ruthless. Now, corruption was a big problem. Any economy, when it develops, you will have corruption coming up. But another target of Xi Jinping is stop corruption. Uh, people say, oh, you stop corruption because you want to purge your opposition. But the people in China really appreciate the corruption fighting of Xi Jinping. Uh, previously, uh, when, I, when I was um, in Hong Kong, I go to, Hong, uh, to China for a conference, something like that. Then we have big banquet, more than you can eat. Days gone, no longer like that. You don't have this. Xi Jinping's usual uh, meal. Of course, he won't cook himself. And I don't, I think his wife might cook a little bit, but not often. So we, when we try to investigate what kind of uh, meal Xi Jinping typically have. If he is visiting, he eats whatever the people's eating. He is very happy to go into a poor village home, look at what is on the stove and eat together with the villager. And when he is in a small city, he likes to visit the small shops um, and spend about $20 on a bowl of needles. That is Xi Jinping. She, he is able to eat bitterness, <laughs> eat hardship. But of course, when he is stay bankrupt, this old, a totally different story. And you will notice that China's large scale gala, like uh, 2008 Olympic opening or Olympic closing, you will see very extravagant uh, demonstration. I think that's partly because his wife is a singer. His wife knows how to entertain. And so he, he is able to put up this. So next week, we will, we will concentrate on the poverty deviation and give you some examples. And then and the week after Monday, if you want to go online, then I will send out the Zoom invitation at 1.30 to 3 on Zoom for Monday. Monday, Monday. Monday. next Monday. Oh, but next Monday is a holiday. Monday next. 